Hi everyone, this is Sean Blackwell from BipolarAwakenings.com and today we're going to take a look at what in my not so humble opinion is the best therapeutic technique available for resolving previously unshakable psychological, emotional, and spiritual problems of people diagnosed with bipolar disorder. That technique is a modified form of Dr. Stan Groff's holotropic breathwork, which I call bipolar breathwork. So before we can talk about bipolar breathwork, in this video, I'll explain holotropic breathwork. The origins of holotropic breathwork start way back in the psychedelic 60s. At that time, Czech psychiatrist and founder of transpersonal psychology, Dr. Stan Groff, was among the last psychiatrists in the United States to be legally allowed to perform LSD therapy on psychiatric patients. However, once all forms of psychedelic therapy were made illegal in the U.S. in the early 1970s, Stan and his late wife, Christina, began to experiment with using the breath as a way to access the non-ordinary dimensions of the human psyche in the same way that he was able to with LSD. During his research, Stan came to realize that there were a wide variety of non-ordinary states of consciousness, but that not all of these states were beneficial. For example, being drunk or paranoid are non-ordinary states of consciousness that are not healing in any way. But for those non-ordinary states which were beneficial in healing, there was not a specific word. So he coined the term holotropic, which means moving towards wholeness. Holotropic breathwork is a technique which can be used with the intention of deep healing or simply personal development, as they are both really one and the same thing. The underlying assumption of holotropic breathwork is that your body has a bioenergetic system, something that I've described in detail in my video on Kundalini and bipolar disorder. When we become traumatized by certain events, energy blockages are created in this system. The intention of holotropic breathwork is to help you release your traumas by unblocking these energetic channels. This technique has a capacity to release deeply held physical tension, life trauma, perinatal trauma, repressed emotions such as anger, sadness, fear, or even joy, sexual repression, and spiritual energies of a divine or demonic nature. These are just a few examples. Stan refers to the intelligence which releases these blockages as the inner healer, an intelligence of divine origin. This underlying intelligence is as mysterious as it sounds, but don't worry, once you're into a deep holotropic process, most people find the presence of the inner healer to be unmistakable. What exactly is holotropic breathwork composed of? Well, that takes a little bit of explaining. It's a little like trying to tell someone who's never eaten a hamburger what a Big Mac is. But since most of you have eaten a hamburger, let's start with that comparison. When it comes to holotropic breathwork, you might consider the inner healer to be, well, like the hamburger patty. Obviously, a hamburger patty isn't much of a meal. It takes other ingredients to really make it tasty, to really make it sizzle. But before we get to the rest of the ingredients, let's talk about the person who puts the ingredients together, a little like the chef. That is, the certified holotropic breathwork facilitator. They're the person that runs the entire workshop. A breathwork facilitator is someone certified by Groff Transpersonal Training. If the session is not run by someone certified by GTT, then it's not considered to be holotropic breathwork and it's not endorsed by Stan Groff. The facilitator has many responsibilities, but the first one is to ensure that your holotropic breathwork experience is as safe and secure as possible. In order to do this, they need to establish the set and setting of the workshop. The set is the mental state a person brings to the experience, like the thoughts, mood, tone, and expectations. The setting is the physical and social environment. In order to establish the proper set, the facilitator first will have each breather complete a medical form to ensure that they have the physical capacity to do the work safely. For example, people with serious heart problems or retinal issues are not recommended to do holotropic breath work. People with mental disorders, such as bipolar disorder, are also not recommended to do holotropic breathwork, which is why bipolar breathwork was created. Once the client is cleared to breathe, 
They will also be asked to abide by an agreement related to their behavior during the workshop. Most agreements will ask the participants to ensure that they are participating of their own free will, that they keep everything happening at the workshop confidential, that they bring a warm supportive attitude towards the breathwork experience of themselves and of other participants, that they don't harm themselves or others or become violent in any way, that they stay on their breathwork mat during the breathwork session, avoiding standing, that they don't leave the session without being checked by a facilitator, and that no drug or alcohol use happens during the workshop. Regarding the setting, Anyone doing holotropic breathwork will be lying on a mattress or yoga mat. This is a safe space where you're free to fully express your own inner healer without hurting yourself or anyone else. Your breathwork space will have plenty of pillows for comfort and protection, as well as a blanket. It's in this space that you'll begin your inner journey. During the session, it will be the facilitator's job to ensure that breathers don't accidentally hurt themselves. New breathers often underestimate how powerful this process can be. After all, it's just breathing, right? The problem is, though, that every once in a while, a breather may take a position where they may injure themselves or interfere with other breathers. In cases such as these, the facilitator may need to contain the breather physically or simply remind them of the potential danger. Along with protecting the breathers, there are a number of intense experiences that the facilitator may need to help the breather work through. You see, for most people, our natural instincts are to help ease the pain of someone in apparent psychological distress. Groff training teaches facilitators to do exactly the opposite. As opposed to stopping or weakening these powerful experiences, Groff facilitators are trained to help encourage the breather to intensify and express these experiences as best they can. We'll talk more about the sort of support a facilitator provides once we take a look at the various holotropic experiences you may come across. Along with the facilitator, each breather will receive personal support and assistance from a sitter. A typical holotropic breathwork workshop will have two full three-hour breathwork sessions. Prior to the first session, participants are divided into pairs, with one being the breather and the other being the sitter. In the second session, the pair switch roles, with the breather from the first session becoming the sitter in the second, and vice versa. The sitter has a few responsibilities. To start, the sitter is there for emotional support, but usually without the physical contact. It's the first priority of the sitter to try to remain fully present to the breather during the entire session. In a deep holotropic state, the breather can feel the intention of the sitter, so a sitter whose mind is constantly wandering, or even worse, busy on their cell phone, hinders the holotropic process. The sitter is also there to provide any basic assistance that the breather may need. During the session, the breather may need a tissue to sneeze or wipe away tears. They may get cold and want to be covered or even tucked in with a blanket. They may want a cup of water, as the breathing may cause dry mouth. They may even need to spit or vomit. In that case, the sitter will hold a plastic bag for them. If the breather needs to go to the bathroom, the sitter will walk them to the toilet, as the breather should not be left unaccompanied. They may be in a deep state that they themselves are unaware of. Only when asked to by the breather, the sitter may provide some physical contact. A breather may request a hand to hold or a hand on a specific body part. If there is enough trust between the pair, the breather may even want a hug during the session. In situations like this, the sitter needs to be wary of sexual stimulation, as that is strictly prohibited. During body contact, pillows should be placed between the sex organs to ensure no inappropriate contact. During the session, the sitter may also quietly adjust pillows around the mattress area in order to ensure that the breather is protected as they move around the mat. It's important, for example, to ensure that the head, hands, and feet don't risk banging on the floor or a wall. You'll notice that in all of these tasks, the sitter never guides, manipulates, or interferes in the breather's process in any way. Being fully present while staying out of the breather's process takes some practice. That's why the first rule for sitters is always, don't do anything unless you're asked. If the breather needs something, leave it to them to ask for it. And if you're ever in any doubt, quietly talk to the facilitator regarding the best thing to do. Chances are, they'll tell you to do nothing. 
And finally, the sitter is also there to signal the breathwork facilitator if asked to by the breather or if they suspect that more intensive interaction is required. With the set and setting established and the facilitator and sitter ready to go, it's time to get to work. Holotropic breathwork always begins with a relaxation meditation exercise. When a breather lays down on the mat and prepares to go into breathwork, the facilitator will initially guide them into this relaxation exercise. The tone of the exercise will be somewhat sacred as holotropic breathwork is a deeply spiritual, even shamanic practice. The exercise will encourage the breather to bring their inner focus to all parts of their body, relaxing each part along the way. Once the exercise is complete, breathers will be encouraged to begin their breathwork process. As the word breathwork implies, you start this technique by breathing quite forcefully. However, unlike some meditation techniques, there is no specific way to breathe. While the breathing always takes place with the eyes shut because it's an inner process, you can breathe through your nose or your mouth, inhaling and exhaling any way you wish. The breath should be fluid, not having pauses between the inhale and the exhale. Rather, similar to jogging, you just want to breathe with fluidity in and out with a force, but it should also be comfortable. So why is the breath so important in this technique? Well, just as a surfer needs to swim out into the ocean to meet the waves before she can begin surfing, we need to breathe forcefully in order to meet the waves of our unconscious mind. The breathing process helps to bring these waves to the surface. Once we begin to sense these waves arising within us, the emphasis is no longer on the breathing, but on expressing, or surfing, the sensations of that unconscious wave to our best ability. It is as if your entire being becomes a three-dimensional loudspeaker for the inner healer. Speaking of loudspeakers, the next ingredient is music. There are many complexities to a typical holotropic breathwork music set, which are taught during Groff transpersonal training modules. However, the music can be divided into three basic phases. The music initially starts out with strong drumming or beats, often with origins in ancient tribal or modern electronic music. The intention is to encourage the breather to aggressively enter into the breathwork process. This is not a time to be timid. Breathers are encouraged to really go after it. Hit that wave! This powerful rhythmic music continues for about an hour, at which point there is a shift in the music which is more emotionally evocative and is intended to provoke a more emotional response from the breather. For example, it is quite common to see people crying, either tears of sadness or of joy, in the second hour. The third hour shifts into music which is more gentle and relaxing, often taking the breather into a place of deep peace. This particular flow, from aggressive to emotional to relaxing, was in a sense discovered by Groff as a typical way that the inner healer interacts with the breather. With that said, the inner process of each individual breather can vary greatly. During the strong initial phase, people may not hear the loud drumming at all as they enter a deep inner dimension. It's also common to hear breathers screaming during the final minutes of the session where the music is often quite still and meditative. So while the music is intended to reflect a common pattern of healing, the path of each individual breather will be unique. At the end of the session, music will gradually fade to nothing and breathers will come back from their experience on their own accord. Once they come back, breathers are free to share any part of their experience with their sitter and then complete a mandala drawing in silence with the other breathers. The mandala drawing requires no artistic talent, but breathers should simply use the pastel colors available to express their inner experience. The objective of mandala drawing is to use artistic expression to explore your breathwork process in a way that brings a deeper level of understanding and further integration. Sometimes mandalas are quite specific, with people trying to depict the literal experience of what they went through. Other times mandalas are more abstract, symbolically conveying an overall feeling which arose during the session. At some point afterwards, there will be a group sharing session where breathers talk to the group as a whole about their experience. The sharing session is an important part of integration which brings closure to the holotropic breathwork experience. So to sum up, what are the ingredients of holotropic breathwork? The inner healer, a certified facilitator from Groff Transpersonal Training, a safe set and setting, 
The sitter, a relaxation exercise. The breathing, an evocative music set, mandala drawing, and sharing. So if this sounds like a lot, it is. And if any of those ingredients is missing, it's not considered to be holotropic breath work. So now that you understand the components of holotropic breath work, in the next video I'll talk about how bipolar breath work brings a number of modifications and enhancements to this technique so that it can be safe and effective for people labeled with bipolar disorder.